Okay, to get it started, I want to talk about the main question that we all ask ourselves is why? Um, why stay remote? Or for some of us, why am I back in the office? Because my boss told me to, why should I keep doing it? So the more accurate question should be redefining the office. Do we really would see, would describe, would, class, would define the office the same way we did it 100 years ago? Don't worry, I'm not going to deep dive too deep into it, but I do want to talk about the purpose of an office and then jump into the details here. So why do we need an office in the first place? I'm going to, in this PWC study, study I'm sure you're familiar with not the study itself, but the terms here. So from the employer side, an office, a physical office, just to be clear here, because I'm going to jump terms here and there, a physical office is needed for employer productivity because we can monitor and manage them better, space to meet our clients, collaborate, collaborate and build our culture. From an employee perspective, it's a little bit different. It's more about collaboration, personal development, meeting clients, and having access to technology and other things we wouldn't have access to at home. To bring you through the evolution of offices, I'm going to jump a little bit further in the 1960s, where we started with the first office um, where we fostered communications. Then here you see in the middle, we started building cubicle farms to create quieter work environments, but at the same time, increase productivity. The interesting thing why I decided to leave this slide in is remote work. The main topic of this discussion is nothing we just discovered because of COVID or because of technology. We were actually forced in the United States in 1973 because of the OPEC embargo, because commuting was so expensive to allow our certain employees to work, work from home or work from certain co-working spaces. So this was, was actually the first real transition into the remote work world. When the PC, internet, emails, and so on picked up later on, we saw a significantly transition into the space. It became a big topic. You saw institutions, HR firm really looking into the space. COVID from this level helped us a lot. And this is why I want to bring this topic closer to you, because this is where we want to ask ourselves, what did we learn as leaders as an, and remote workers over the last few years? And how would we describe or use this experience defining our workspace going forward? So is this a step back? Is this a step forward? Should it be a hybrid or should it be a mix of both? I think the... the um, Benefits of working from home is, are, are mostly clear, especially from an employer side, from manager side. Overhead costs are real estate and other costs are significantly lower. Production and retention rate is perceived to be better. We can argue about this later on in the Q&A. And hiring, because in the global space where you do have access to different states, countries, and so on, hiring or this job market becomes a little bit more competitive, which makes it attractive for employers. Employees, us on the other side, we like the location and dependency, the work-life balance. Another discussion point, the time savings, especially when you're from California, missing, I am not missing those two hours in commute in LA and the autonomy I have with the flexible um, work schedule. I hopefully can create myself. I want to bring up a few things, a few perception I want to purposely tackle this. It's not about tech, all tech. We all have seen the announcements over the last year and a half from Twitter, Square, Slack, Google, Shopify, Facebook, and so on, saying, oh, we're going to just going to stay online. We're going to go hybrid. We allow those and those employees to stay online. In tech, which makes a lot of sense, is a, is a field that is inclined to do this. But you also see it in an industry that is not as, as obvious. Those companies, for example, here, and I have to stay with my home for a little bit at least, Siemens is a German industrial uh, engineering uh, company decided a, a year and a half back to give 140,000 Siemens employees permanent uh, permit, uh, sorry, permanent allowance to work from home. Future, a huge step in, the, in their future. The same for French automaker PSA. You probably know Peugeot, Citroën, and others. They announced a new era of agility, which then led to the idea of can we increase productivity from home? And we're talking about non-production non stuff. So they built this whole framework around it and they're taking it far. 
And a company I want to emphasize here, a company that really took it far is Simpress, the holding company, oh, sorry, the, the parent company behind Vista, the printing company you might be familiar with, because this company took 20% of the employees online and started building a team around it in a remote experience team that pretty much focuses on only on do you have the right skill, the right tools, do you have the right environment, resources, and everything you need to be productive and engaged and um yeah, a committed member to the workforce as the other 80% are currently. So what it brings to us is the question, how does it affect other markets and what trends came from this um, finding that remote work might not just be a temporary thing because of COVID, it might be here to stay. Something you saw uh, is the donut effect in the real estate market. You see many um, employers intentionally or willingly or not that moved online decided Hey, I want to move more. I want to have more space. If I work from home anyway, why not have a second office? Why not go to a nicer place permanently? So you see a real estate market now going significantly higher besides the fact that it goes higher everywhere, but higher in low density and mid density area. So the, the remote workers escape to the suburbs. Question if it stay or not is something I want to discuss for today. Another trend, and it should not be a surprise, is that the number of remote workers over the last 10, 12 years significantly increased by 100 to 160%. Well, you can argue, obviously, COVID, I'm not surprised. It's not like we made actively the decision we want to work from home. What is the surprise, so, or at least hopefully an eye-opener for some of you, is the Gallup prediction that about 37% of the workers that can work remote might not return to the office at all or don't want to be um, go to the office, back to the office. So it's either employer or employee uh, pro decision making uh, decision process. The other interesting part, which I'm actually part of, three out of 10 employees don't go back to work if there's no remote capability. Every job I have now, every job I had over the last seven years had at least some remote capability, even full remote capability. So I think in my understanding, it's a really high number to have 30% of the employees saying, I don't even want to work for a company. It does not even give me this benefit to a certain degree. This is something you see in the Glassdoor research here on the right. The monthly research, or the monthly search numbers are significantly higher than they were in the past, and they keep increasing because uh, the supply is now catching up. Talking about the remote work, I want to push the envelope a little bit further and go to the more, I wouldn't say outlier, the more frontier side of remote work. The traditional remote worker, I'm going to define it in a second. There's also the digital nomad, which is the second part of our agenda today. The second part of the topic is growing at a significant rate as well. Just to throw some numbers out here, research that has been done by MBO partners about two years ago shows that we have currently about 11 million people that are considered themselves or considered digital nomads. This number might be about to double or 80% up in the next two, three years. We even have 64 million maybes in the pile. So if you see the truth somewhere in the middle, that's a huge multiplier of two to 300%. In my understanding, something you want to consider either on the employer side or specifically on the, on the leadership side, because this is something was a, a type that we might not have considered before. So let me take a minute here to define what this type really is. What is a digital nomad? In the past, digital nomads were more considered people that lived in bands, you know, work for social media companies, travel a little bit, a small part of the population, nobody really took them seriously. Now the gap between digital nomads and remote workers is narrowing down. And you see there's a lot of common ground here. Besides the fact that location independence is a huge factor for both, you also see that the attractiveness of digital nomad life spills over to the remote workers as well. Those digital nomads are, or the way they think, and we're going to discuss the mindsets later on in the Q&A, they want a high engagement rate. They want experience. Classic millennium behavior, in my understanding, or Gen Z, they want a diversified experience, cultures, and they want to see the world as much as they can. They don't want to put their whole, their way, their life in on hold just because of a job and opportunity. They move on to the next because technology, the environment now allows them to do so. 
and many people are now catching up to, to this environment. You even see countries now um, um, allowing or promoting the work remote visas because they see Mexico is one a big example. You see people going there for a couple of months and they want to stay and have a great time and being exposed to different viewpoints of the world. So the result for me, this is an extension or kind of redefinition of the spectrum we already have. People work, um, people start on, um, our generation, the generations before started on the traditional cubicle desktop side. Now thinking about, do we need to redefine how we work? And is the future of the work a little bit further to, excuse me, a little bit further on the right side of the spectrum here? So do we see, more people going into hybrid? Yes, 70% of the people that were surveyed in multiple surveys saying, I want to work somewhat hybrid. The question is now, what is hybrid for you? Is this the allowance to work from home and take care of your children and take care of um, your relatives and so on and other things and just have the flexibility? Or does it go as far as remote workers to say, I'm gonna move out of state? because I want to be close to my family. I don't need to live in San Francisco. I don't need to live in, in LA because I, my, all my family is in a different state. So give me the ability to work there. For me, it's not about experience. It's about, I want to choose the location. Location independence is important. Digital nomads, however, all the, on the right side of the spectrum, for me, the frontier is a very different animal, a very different mindset, but they require a similar, um, supply a similar um, universe of, um, of technology like the remote worker does. Good. So to finish up, and I said earlier, I might have to cut short a little bit. I want to now synthesize this to what, is, what are the challenges we are facing, especially in the level of leadership. If you look at the right side here, McKinsey, and I want to summarize it here, really emphasizes relationship building is a huge issue. This is early in COVID. Later on, you see that on the left side uh, and buffer and the updated research is very similar. Collaboration, building relationships and feeling you're integrated, included in the team is one of the main issues we face when we go into remote world. Because the, what we wanna compare is, is this the evolution or is this an alternative to what we experienced, what we all know before COVID hit us in, in 2020. So a few other things I want to highlight before I move on here on the left side is the, um, the obstacles you face at home. It, uh, it might start off for some of you, uh, loneliness, huge issue. You feel you spend so many hours at home that you feel lonely. You might not have family surrounding you because of the, um, because of the choices, career choices you, you made, different state and so on. A much more, a much bigger problem or Similar problem is the distraction. Similar, different, different environment, distraction, because you have family and member at home, you cannot stay focused, you cannot take vacation really, you cannot really unplug entirely. So at this point, work is invading your private life so much, it has a consequence of terms we're gonna talk about later, uh, workalism and, um, and Zoom cast, tech cast, and so on. Okay. Like I said, I'm gonna keep it short. How does it require us as a leader to think differently? If you or the company made a decision to say, I want to go online, what things do I need to consider? We talked about some of them and I tried as best as I could based on personal experience and academic research to summarize it in, sorry, in this chart, in this chart here. It starts off with the realization that remote work has obstacles that start with yourself and with trust. And I'm gonna keep it on those two because I will not get any further today. And what I mean by this, you cannot lead with, here we go, you cannot lead with, uh, by example, if you don't take care of yourself first. So maintaining a regular schedule meaning blocking off time in your calendar visibly, visibly for, your, for your colleagues, for your peers. I'm going to take my kids to school. I have lunch. I'm going to do some exercises. I'm going to take a break because um, there's a personal emergency coming up. 
making open you up a little bit more and really be more consistent about the schedule is important since we are now drowning in both lives at the same time. Personal health on your on your own end, but as important on as on your team is something that you need you need to consider. Preparation and agendas. I want to emphasize this here. Um, this is the time I have left because this is something that is often underestimated and not really highlighted is the preparation going into virtual meetings. It's not as it's, it's such an important part of the remote world compared to the in-person world that it shows up in surveys and frustration and so on constantly. Going into meetings does not mean let's take a meeting and let's see how it goes down. It means as a manager to be proactive about it and uh, allow brainstorming through emails, Slack, group documentations, whatever it is beforehand. So this, the, the meeting itself, which should be concise, is purely for decision making. So the team can move on to the actual production uh, mode uh, itself. Okay, there's two minutes I have left. I want to dive into a book I highly rec uh, recommend by Sedal Neely. Um, she, re um, she published this this week, uh, sorry, this year or last year called Remote Work Revolution. You're going to see it at the end of this presentation, which talks about trust and the way we understand trust and the tools we have to build trust. To start off with a definition, she defines two terms, cognitive trust, which is a trust you build we all built, we all built in this program as well through track record, pretty much. We come in, we have certain experience, we work on other projects together and it takes a little bit of time, but it builds over time and it is sufficient for most communications outside of your team, cross-functional uh, cross or with, with clients to a certain degree, but it's not enough. And this is what I wanna highlight, not enough for remote teams. Since we are missing though daily interactions on, on so many occasions, emotional trust is a huge component that needs to be proactively addressed by the leader. So emotional trust is something that you will find early on to build when you find common values and common mindset, but it's much more complex and might even take more time to build it because it takes time or it takes a proactive decision from the leader to say, I want to make time to allow my employees to see who I am and also understand them and also within the team. Something that was, is easy for us in person, but something that is very difficult for us online because we all find the end Zoom button very quickly and then leave and go on to the next meeting where we have to um, work, on a, maybe we work on a new project. I see some of my, my panelists already here. So I'm gonna cut it short here. I'm more than happy to follow up with the rest because I think there's a lot of value in there. I just wanna give you the advice. Um, this book is particularly good. I, I read it over the weekend and I, I would encourage you to do so as well. You will find the summary of my, on my slide deck, but for now, I wanna take the time we have left to see if my, my panel is complete. I see all of them, I think. And Want to give them a minute to introduce themselves. So before we start, this panel is amazing. That's why I have to pivot it, pretty much pivot it over the weekend with a slide deck. It was designed to do 45 minutes to now a panel I'm really um, eager to, to introduce. All of them have been exposed to digital nomads to a certain degree. This turn was not well um, uh, recognized in the past. They all are more than familiar with the remote world for more than two years, three years, and then invited them to talk about their personal experience and give advice to you. Because my objective, my personal objective for today is to allow you to walk away for with some reminders, maybe one or two additional tools in your portfolios, a portfolio of remote leadership, but also to make you aware of there are some digital nomads out there that might be talented and you might want to consider in your, in your portfolio as well. So that's enough for me. I welcome, let me share actually the screen as well. Just one sec, and here we go. Let me welcome Melissa, Scott, Chris, and Yanis for today's panel. We have about 30 minutes, so if Melissa, if you don't, if you don't mind, I'm going to ask yourself, uh, you first to give us a 30 second, six second introduction about your background. 
and um, yeah, let me move on. Hi, I'm Melissa Smith. I'm a virtual assistant matchmaker, trainer, and remote work consultant specializing in the hiring process. I went remote as my company's first employee in 2013, um, became location independent in 2017. Hey, Scott, you want to go next? Absolutely. Thanks for having me. My name is Scott Kais. I'm the founder and chief flight expert at Scott's Cheap Flights. Uh, we are a technology service that helps alert our more than 2 million members anytime an amazing cheap flight pops up from their home airport. And uh, like Melissa, I've been location independent, been a remote company since day one when we began as a company in 2015 and frankly, when it became as a, uh, began as a hobby in 2013. So uh, been many years of experience leading up to the pandemic in remote work that hopefully helped uh, helped us carry through. Thank you, Scott. Chris, are you ready? I'm always ready. Yes. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Chris Dyer. I'm a remote work expert. Uh, we went fully remote back in 2009 uh, during the uh, sort of financial crisis and originally did it just because we wanted to save money and we found out we loved it and it was a much better way to work. So Excited to be here so far on the panel. Melissa Smith is one of my favorite people. I get Scott's emails every day in my email box. So it's nice to meet you. I think I've met Giannis before. So anyways, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to get this party started. So I'll uh, shut up and let Giannis go next. It is a small world indeed. Giannis, truly uh, his nomad life in the car. I hope you, you can share your insights with us. Yeah, sure. Like I've been a digital nomad for about uh, eight years now, currently in Mexico City. And um, yeah, I started working as a video producer for a lot of digital nomads. So I was flying to their destinations to record their pitch and their promotion videos. But uh, during the last years, I was also building up a production company in Germany that I'm completely reading remote. So I have my team there. I've got equipment there, but I'm usually traveling and um, yeah, working online. Great, thank you, Yannis. And we, I can hear this well enough. Um, I want to start with a question, and and if you don't mind, we're going to keep the, the round in the same order for now. With the question, why you initially decide to go remote? Because I think all of you went remote before COVID, so it was not a forced decision. And the second part of the question is, why do you decide to stay remote, Melissa? Sure. So I went remote uh, because I needed much more freedom and flexibility. And for clarification, I don't do anything technical. Like you're not going to catch me coding. I'm not like super fancy. Um, so it wasn't just like technical work that I was doing. It was assistant work, executive assistant work, uh, which is why I use the term location independent. But uh, my husband passed away suddenly. He committed suicide in 2012. And that just changed our whole family upside down. Um, but I was doing a lot of travel to meet family and friends, to stay connected, to um, get back on my feet. And yet I still loved my work. I didn't want to ask for time off all the time to do my work just because I was traveling. Um, and it was also great and therapeutic for me to do the work that I loved and felt like a, you know, one area of my life I could be making um, a difference and then you know, one day I just went to my boss to give my notice and he said, we don't want to lose you. How can we keep you? And just like that, I pitched the idea. I don't need to be here in the office. I could do what I do from anywhere. And he said, okay, let's do that. Um, so then I became their first remote employee. And once you get that taste of freedom and flexibility, you don't want to let it go. I'd never experienced so much, uh, especially as an executive assistant. And so that was that was it for me and uh, i've now like ruined myself i could never imagine going back into the office and quite frankly now um since covid you know i was never a fan of telling people oh you have to do this you have to do this but now that people see it i think it's a sign to me that a company is very antiquated um, when they don't have remote options so they wouldn't be a consideration for me because i don't want to work with anyone or anything that's antiquated in my work Thank you, Melissa. And I, I can jump in right away for me. 2015, same conversation. Took my, I gave my two week notice and the company allowed me to move to the United States. And since remote and not going back. But a very a different story 
Scott, you did not turn in any notice. You just said, I'm going to build it from scratch. That's right. So the reasons why I'm such an advocate of remote work today are actually very different from the reasons why we started as a all remote company back in 2015. I started as an all remote company because it was just me. And I figured, look, I'm making this money. Why do I need to go pay for office space, scout out office location, pay for all the overhead and all the administration when I have this internet connection? I have all the tools available to me today to be able to work just as well from home. I don't have to spend that time commuting. And so it just made sense as the default, I don't need an office. I, I can make the world my office, the world I'm being, as long as I have my computer and an internet connection there, I can be doing my work from. What ended up being the later reasons though, as we started to hire more uh, employees, uh, you know, my, first myself and then finding my co-founder, Brian, a few months later, and then us hiring more folks, was realizing that, uh, first of all, I was in Colorado, he was in Southeast Asia, First of all, where were we going to open our office? I didn't want to move there. He didn't want to move to Colorado. So we already had a bit of a question, even if it had ever been a consideration to open an office. But secondly, as we started hiring other folks, we realized this isn't a drawback not having an office. This is a huge opportunity to be able to cast such a wide net hiring where I didn't have to be hiring people who happened to live within 20 miles of where I was at that moment, but rather I, we could hire folks from around the country, from around the world. Anybody whose qualifications fit what we were looking for, we could really uh, uh, you know, they were potential coworkers. And so that ended up helping us build a much better team because we could optimize for skill set, for fit, for match, for ambition, all those types of things, rather than optimizing first for location and then hoping after location, we found those other matches. So it ended up being a really, I think, beneficial thing, even if the reason why we started in the first place was just out of convenience. Thank you, Scott. And I actually do have a follow-up question, but I, I want to ask Chris before, because his story, I think, is very similar. Cost reasons was your initial, initial reason why you went online. Is that correct, Chris? Yeah, we were just fortunate that our lease had just come up and it was either lay people off or find a way to save money. So that was definitely why we started. And then the reason, I think the second part of your question was, why did we stay? Because within two weeks of us going remote, every one of my employees that I directly kind of oversaw, so it was about 30 some people had called me and said, I love this. Please don't ever make us go back. I don't ever want to go back to an office ever again. And I kind of went, huh, that's weird. I thought you guys all liked being in the office. <laughs> and I went and I went, I get it because I love being remote. I, I was hundred times more productive. And I enjoyed hanging out with the dog all day instead of half of my employees. Um, you know, so like it was immediate that you know, we all understood the value of it. Um, the challenges were, how do you do it correctly? Right. And we had to start really thinking about how we could collaborate in a different way, but immediately we were, we were really excited to do it. And this was back 2009, long before it was cool to be remote. It was actually frowned upon. It was something we kind of had to hide from people. We didn't really tell clients about uh, because they wouldn't take you seriously. Even though we had, you know, we have between employees and independent contractors, over 3000 people who work for me, they still would kind of look at you strange back then, you know, if you told them you were remote. So talking about uh, looking at someone strange. Uh, I see, I follow Yannis for a while and he's posting pictures from Mexico, Dubai, all over the world. Um, how do you handle your employees? Um, so yeah, for me, it was a pretty easy decision because I've built all my business around my desired lifestyle. My mother recently told me a story that I couldn't remember anymore, but apparently when I entered school um, and I had homework for the first time, I was sitting at home, crying, saying, saying like, the school takes all my life away. And uh, apparently at that age, I already made the plan to make my life in a way that it feels like an endless summer holiday. Um, so when I first started my company as one man show, of course, I needed to do it while traveling because that was my desired lifestyle. I want to travel. I want to see the world. I want to make experience. Um, and then later when I grew the company, 
I was for, kind of trapped in that old mindset of building like a company in one place. So I first started growing my production company was in Hamburg. So I was flying there more recently, uh, more often. I, I rented a studio and an office there and I built my team there. But then I realized it doesn't really make sense to tell my employees to go to the office while they see me traveling all the world, making those nice experiences. And I came to the same conclusion as the other uh, people in this panel, like it just also doesn't make sense financially to, ha to have this office that people don't want to be at to, to, to pay for it. And also just rent people within like a 20 miles range because there's so much talent all through Germany, all around the world. So since I decided to also make my company remote and most of my team remote, um, I had a much more easy time to, to find great people, the living great work. And they're so passionate about their job because now I also enable them to live the life that they desire and not only um, take that right for myself. Yes. It is uh, exactly where, where I'm standing. Um, but on this note, um, Janis, and maybe you or Scott can assist you as well, because one major issue for, I mean, Scott, you both, you both started pretty much online right from the start. Um, productivity. You both have companies that are global by definition, a travel company, a payment company. You don't have, you don't have local clients. You move. Was um, keeping your employees productive, motivated ever an issue? What tools would you give our leaders? Uh, yes. I want to start or should I? Okay. Um, so I think the most important thing is to not forget about the human part of it. I mean, if you have an office, it happens naturally that you meet by the coffee machine, you have a chat over the weekend and um, how things in life are going. And once you go remote, unless you really schedule time for it, you don't do those things. And I think that's one of the biggest traps that you lose touch and lose connection to your employees. You don't know what's going on with them, if they're happy or not, if they're productive or not, what kind of challenges they face. And I think it's really important to make time for that as often as possible. Um, so yeah, I, almost every day I'm having calls with my teams, um, of course about work, like uh, the things that are going on, but also about private stuff, you know, like um, it's 50-50 literally for me, like especially I, I always take time to ask, how they feel about their job, if there are things that are frustrating them, um, other things like new tools that they need, new software, new equipment or anything. Um, yeah, I think it's really important to plan enough time for this like human connection part of it. Mm -hmm. yeah, yes, you mentioned that you still have an office in Hamburg. Is this an option for you for social events or do you do everything online now? Actually, two months ago, I uh, sold the office. Um, yeah, I don't have it anymore. Now we're like fully remote. There's no meeting pass anymore. The only things I have in Germany is vans for the equipment and the equipment itself. Um, I've parked the vans in like some of the major cities of Germany, like Hamburg, Cologne, and Munich. Um, so whenever someone of my team has a production, they can like get the equipment at the van, go to the client, but we don't have like the fixed meeting point anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, but it also makes it more exciting because yeah, I, I do intend to host more team events in future and we're not stuck to that one office that we're already paying for to do so. So um, I might have a team meeting. Mid March in the Alps together to like work physically together and to meet and to get to know some of them are going to see for the first time i had their remote i only had contact on the phone or through zoom so yeah it's also like, excited to have this kind of vocations thank you Janis. i i want to pass it on to, to scott with, with the same question you mentioned productivity earlier you now were in the position to select the most ambitious employees but they're spread all over so have you met all your employees? I have, except for the folks who started just in the past couple months. We've made a point to try to do pretty regular meetups. Um, for, so the entire team gets together twice a year for retreats. Uh, some of them, some of that time is just for fun, for socializing, just to, we like each other, we hang out, we like to spend time with one another. And then some of that's actually work, that sort of, uh, um, you know, Call, uh, that 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 water cooler uh, uh, chat that that Giannis mentioned critical something that absolutely gets lost to a certain degree by working remotely that I think you need to try to find instances to recreate by in-person 
collaboration. But the biggest thing when you talk about productivity for remote companies, it's not just, you know, making sure you have all the systems and processes in place. It's not just, uh, uh, you know, putting out enough uh, uh, kind of expensable uh, uh, opportunities for employees to have good equipment and all this and that. I think it really boils down to good hiring, making sure that you are hiring folks in a way that you're optimizing for people who are independent, who are self-motivated, who are self-disciplined and able to work towards goals rather than being only productive when they have their boss standing over their shoulder. You know, I think that that notion is thankfully becoming a bit more uh, antiquated that, you know, the only way to be productive is if productive is if you're in the office so people can see what you're doing. Because look, I've worked in offices before. I know there's plenty of, uh, uh, let's just say, unproductive things happening in there. And there's plenty of incredibly productive work that's happening at home. And so not only making sure that you're hiring people who are geared towards working independently and towards able to work towards outcome, but also setting up so that you're what you're optimizing for is not necessarily a clock in system. You know, we don't worry about, you have to be on not at 9 a.m. sharp and you have to be off at 5 p.m. sharp. We try to get more outcome oriented where we say, these are the goals. These are the things we want to accomplish. Do them at, you know, at your pace at the time that you think is most acceptable. Show up to meetings when you're expected to be, but otherwise we're not going to be standing over your shoulder and trying to ha uh, hire people who can accept and handle that responsibility responsibility well. I would like to piggyback on what Scott said. I think yes. Scott really said um, a lot of, of great things. Um, and the, just the one thing I would add to that is I don't know that I would actually hire people who are ambitious. Um, that would be my number one quality that I'm hiring for. I would say the number one thing that and the number one ability that you can bring to your team is reliability. So if I were going to be hiring for one thing, it'd be the reliable person and a reliable person Sorry. is just that they're going to be reliable regardless. And Melissa, some of the um, things that we have really studied yeah. and done quite a bit to make sure is not just our opinion or what we think is happening, but we really put a lot of data and a lot of, you know, kind of science behind this. Um, what we found is that remote workers, actually their number one value of instead of like what's these traditional things that employees want work-life balance for a traditional employee is not something that's in their top six, right? But it is the number one thing for a remote employee. So that ability to control their time, have autonomy to manage their time. If they could literally be working in office yesterday and then today they're now a remote employee and their whole focus shifts. So if we're doing anything as leaders to kind of impact that in a negative way, the ability for them to have that, then we can start to have unhappy people. Um, you had better have highly curated meetings if you're going to run a remote team. If you don't start meetings on time and if you don't have very distinct meetings that, for different types of meetups, not just a general, we always meet for an hour on Zoom, you're going to struggle with, with people being happy. Um, and then two things that we've done that have really, really helped us. And I mean, we saw sig radically significant differences in our employees reporting back um, happiness, um, satisfaction with their job, satisfaction with their manager, um, things like that was we got rid of all email internally. So all communications must be on Slack between teams. I don't, I'm not, I'm not necessarily saying it has to be Slack, but an internal place to, to do what Scott was saying, have recreate those water cooler movement uh, mo uh, moments, right? Where if you're going to communicate in a room with a team, everyone can see the communication. You're not suddenly becoming lonely where no one can see what's happening. Um, email is also kind of crappy. Everyone with CCs everyone because they want to cover their butt, right? And you end up with like 900 more emails than you needed to get when you could have just had it in the Slack room, right? And then everyone could see it. Everyone knew it happened, right? And then the last one is we got rid of almost all one-on-one -on -one meetings. So when you have a remote team, I'm a big believer that you need to meet with your team. You need to be meeting with groups of people almost all of the time. There are exceptions, but one-on-one -on -one meetings, I think are unproductive. They slow leaders down. They create bottlenecks in the organization. So you ought to be hopping on a call with three or four people, five people, solve a problem, chat, get things figured out, create that cool culture glue and then go away. So. Chris, if you, if you don't mind, I, I want to challenge this for, for a second. Uh, the one-on-one -on -one meeting for yeah. 
since we talked about global hiring, Scott brought up, you know, very ambitious people you might not find next town. They have a very different language, cultural background, introverts, extroverts, and so on. So I might not be as comfortable talking about my, my background, my health, when I have two other people on board. You got rid of one-on-one -on -one meetings. So how do you overcome this issue, me not sharing and building up emotional trust? Right. So there are some exercises that we have our managers do to really help people get comfortable with sharing. Now, if you're going to start sharing personal things, I think that should be inside your consistent team. You don't grab someone from marketing and suddenly have them talking to someone in accounting they don't have a relationship with and asking them to tell you their deepest, darkest secrets. I mean, that's just not going to work. But inside their team that they work with on a regular basis, they should have that comfortable sort of sense to do that. Uh, I, I will say that leaders often feel inept and they feel like they're struggling because they have all these direct reports coming to them, complaining and sharing and telling them all these things going on in their lives. And they are not the right person to be helping them. They're not the best person to be help addressing their issues. But you get them in a group of five to seven people and suddenly someone brings something up and someone else has been through that and they have a real suggestion. This is why group therapy is the thing. Right. And this is why people go to a group because there are common interests, common shared values that a group of people can help each other do far better than just a single person. Now, if someone's really having a difficult time, that may be some really, really tragic issue thing has happened in their lives, or maybe they're underperforming and you're having more of an HR type of a conversation, I'm totally for one on ones. But when you're going through the day to day minutiae, it is far better to be in a group setting and you get way more sharing and way more problem solving in that kind of uh, scenario. That's also part of the hiring process because if, if people don't understand like, hey, you, know, you don't have to share everything with us on, on day one, we don't, we're not gonna ask for this kind of information, but this is a part of our company culture. And if you don't ever feel like you're gonna get to this place with us, then we're probably not the right company for you, that any part of your communication strategy should be absolutely 100% upfront. The worst kind of communication strategy is when people agree on the same thing and yet argue about it. It's not actually when you disagree or when you have conflict, it's when you're agreeing yet you're still arguing at the same time. Um, and when people don't know that upfront, like if you're not communicating with people that you're hiring that, hey, we're all on Slack here. If someone was like, oh, I am not a Slack person that like they should know now, just the same as you run your meetings. All that should be definitely part of the hiring process because it, all of it fits into your company culture. It's a actually an interesting point, Melissa. I was about to, to ask you this because we had this really productive conversation a few days ago and you mentioned one keyword that kind of stick with me about hiring. When you hire a remote worker, you hire an entrepreneur. Can you talk about this a little bit? Yeah, so, you know, pre-COVID hiring was super great for uh, remote companies because we knew what we were hiring for in the beginning. We were hiring for someone who has that bit of entrepreneurship because they're owning part of what they're doing. They're not going to be a hustler necessarily. We don't, we don't even want that, but you're looking for that person who owns it. And what happened with COVID is you didn't get to do that. You're, you didn't get to hire for that person um, because in fact, there are people who do need to be watched. They, they know it, you know it. That's not the best remote em employee. And the best remote employee is again, that person who is reliable, who doesn't need someone or want someone looking over their shoulder. They want that uh, autonomy in their work. In order to do that, you have to have that bit of entrepreneurship that says, I own this. This is mine. I understand how the chips fall. I understand what happens when I don't get my thing done on time and what it does to everyone else on the team or, or how it affects and, and creates these mass ripples that all of a sudden now everyone has to make up or maybe someone else's time is not used wisely maybe they have to cut back on time with their family because I didn't get my thing done on time. It's really overseeing the company as if I own it because I care about all the people as much as I care about myself. I'm not clocking in and clocking out and say, well, done now. I'm really thinking about the company as a whole and the best remote companies, um, really the best companies enter, you know, they're, that's what their employees are, are doing for one another. But if you're not doing that and that person is 
yeah, I'll just get my work done. I'll just, you know, check in, check out. That's not really what you're, you're looking for. You need someone to really own it because you also need someone who's going to unblock themselves. We get blocked sometimes and you need someone who's going to feel comfortable to raise their hand and say, Hey, I'm not getting this and not wait for someone to come to you and waste days or hours or weeks on things that you're just not able to handle yourself. And that includes your own personal boundaries. You need someone to say, hey, you seem kind of, you know, not yourself lately. Um, yeah, we want managers and we want um, supervisors and bosses who are able to do that. But we also need employees to come and say, I am so burned out right now. I, I am so overwhelmed. Like, you've got to get me help. You, you have to help me with this assignment. Like, do you realize I have three competing priorities right now? Like, which one do you want? If the employees aren't speaking up about that, there's no way for the company to really help them out. And it makes it so much harder because now we're trying to come in after the fact and say, oh, well, now we need to give you time. And now we realize we have a hiring process uh, failure. We need, we need to hire more people. So again, it's on all, all facets of it. You need someone who's really comfortable um, to be able to do that. And it's not an introvert or extrovert quality. It's an ownership quality, ownership of yourself, ownership of your work, and um, believing that other people just have the right for the, the autonomy and the freedom and flexibility just as much as you do. I, I love that Chris and Melissa formulating a very clear profile of remote workers. And I want to pull Scott in and maybe Yanis as well, since he's not in the car anymore. I heard just, I heard about a profile. I know we're running out of time. But I just want to place this one question. I heard about a profile that remote workers tend to need to be owners. They need to fit into the culture. Cultural values or fit is much more important than maybe it has been in the past. Scott, is this your hiring criteria? Do you believe people can change? I think what you need to make sure you are um, hedging against when you do try to hire for culture, hire for fit, is that you're not hiring for homogeneity. You're not hiring for group think. You're because uh, you know at the end of the day, you need people to be able to certainly feel psychologically safe for to be able to, uh, as we say, disagree and commit. But you don't want to find yourself in a position where you only are hiring folks who look and think and act exactly like yourself, exactly like the hiring committee, and then find that your bad ideas are never getting challenged, that your, uh, uh, you know, your assumptions are never getting questioned. And so while I think you do want to generate, you know, and one of the policies we have, we only hire people we actually like like spending time with, like hanging out with, even if, you know, the, we're hiring folks who we're very willing to, to, to publicly disagree with uh, on, 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 on issues. Uh, that I think is the key at the end of the day, not hiring for a single way of thinking, but hiring for people that you respect, that you like hanging out with, that you would want to grab a beer with after work, even after you have these contentious debates. And as a quick uh, comment on this before we have to uh, close. Yeah, I totally agree on that. Of course, it's super important to like uh, hanging out together since you're not forced to do it anymore. You know, you're not in the office stuck together. Um, so the best way to encourage to communicate with each other is that actually everybody enjoys it. Um, and uh, I totally agree on the other point as well of self ownership and intrinsic motivation. I think I'm you know, usually with my team, it's that way, like, if someone's not performing well, I, I more have to like build them up because they're going to come to me like, oh, I'm, I'm so disappointed about myself. I did not do, I did not manage to complete this task. And task. And I'm usually the one being most relaxed about it, building it up like, hey, you've been doing great, this kind of things. I think remote, uh, remote leadership doesn't work if you're stuck with people who just want to do the minimum it might work in an office to a certain point because you can look what people are doing but it doesn't work remote you know like people you can't you can't really control what people are doing so you have to find people that are motivated about the work who enjoy their work who enjoy the kind of freedom that you can give them with the kind of job they're doing and of course that you want to uh, spend time with that you enjoy talking to because that's the only way to to really encourage people to be good at their job it's also really important to remember the scale here Right. So M Melissa's answer was about someone, you know, they're dependable. And I think Scott was talking about entrepreneurial. 
And so the size of your organization is really going to depend upon the philosophy of how you're going to hire and what kinds of people you want. I'll tell you, when we get up to 3,000 people, I, I can't worry about whether or not they like each other. There's going to be people who don't like each other, right? I mean, there's, I cannot possibly have that. When it was 12 people, absolutely, right? We want to have hire people we want to go have a beer with. But at 3,000, it's about having good systems, good practices, making sure that you're taking all these ideas and pushing them down to the team level, to the manager and their couple, their direct reports, and making sure they're focusing on making that environment as good as it can be. And that will reflect on the rest of the organization as a whole. So you need to think about where you are in this, you know, sort of uh, spectrum at, to, to decide how you might want to take the advice that you've heard today and put it into place. Well, Chris, thank, thank you, you so much. very much, team. Uh, Tim, we have to wrap up. Yes. So I just want to say, you know, every panelist, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule wherever you are. I know you're spread all, all over. Um, I'm going to follow up. I saw a lot of really good questions in the chat box as well. I actually want to take some time to answer later on because I didn't finish my presentation on purpose because I think the insight here from those experts is much more valuable than me talking for another 30 minutes. So I, I want to wrap it up with this. And if you have any other questions, please you know, don't hesitate. I'm going to share contact information because we do have some people yet published books about this as well and have their blogs, have their email distribution and strong, obviously very strong opinions about this as well, based on experience. So I'm gonna share this with everybody later on in the workspace, and then I'm looking forward to see the next session coming up soon. So Melissa, Scott, Chris, Yanis, thank you so much for taking the time.